Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's Fix Us conversation. This is uh, Mike Murphy, director of Fix Us. Uh, for those new to Fix Us, this is a project of the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. It's intended to better understand, bring attention to, and work with many others to address our nation's uh, growing divisions, our dysfunctions and paralysis, and our political system, and associated distrust of the public uh, with many in our governing institutions. Uh, and as a result of all this is inhibiting action on a range of issues. So today's discussion uh, is the first of what we're dubbing Fix Us Conversations, which is a series of events that serve as one small piece of our Fix Us efforts to advance our cause. I encourage you, if you're interested, to check out uh, more at fixusnow.org uh, for folks uh, to check out all the activities of Fix Us. But specifically, the purpose of these conversations are to take a step back from the current anxiety and politics surrounding us all with the pandemic, to step back uh, from the politics around this election. That's not our focus. Rather, uh, this series of conversations uh, intends to have one-on-one -on -one discussions with leading experts that have studied these issues uh, regarding what are the root cause factors, what are the reasons that our country has gotten us to this point. Now, importantly, there's two core assumptions that we enter into these conversations with uh, for framing. First is that there's no single cause set of theories that's gotten us uh, to this point. And second, as we know that the factors that have gotten us here are long-term in the making, they far predate our current political power structure in Washington the last few years. And many of the study of this believe these factors have been going on for many decades to get us where we are. So with that framing of purpose, uh, in my view, there's no one better to have first such virtual conversation with uh, than Mickey Edwards. Uh, Congressman Edwards has become uh, close with us on our Fix Us efforts in recent years. It's really great to have him. Uh, he's someone who's been studying, talking about these issues for many years. Has incredibly vast experience to bring to the discussion on this, not only serving in Congress, uh, but many may not know, Mickey was also a journalist at one time. And he's taught in academia at Princeton and Harvard for several years. And um, he's also for many years headed up the Rodell Fellows Program at the Aspen Institute amongst many other accomplishments. So Mickey, I'm really uh, happy to have you with us today. Before we jump in to our uh, discussion, I just wanna let folks know that I know we have, we have several hundred folks signed up that are watching. Uh, we are gonna try to get some Q&A going here too from folks, there's a Q&A feature here in the bottom. So folks, please can use that and I'll try to get to as many as I can to weave them into the discussion. Many of you sent questions in advance, so I'm gonna weave those in too. Uh, and also as note, we are recording this. Uh, so folks that are on this, uh, assuming our technology works well, we will share this recording uh, with folks and also uh, share it with many others that couldn't come uh, in the days ahead. So there's my intro to the discussions. Mickey, here's where we're going to start off. I'm going to start off, we're just going big picture here, okay? You've been, as I've said, studying, examining these issues for a long time. If you're going sort of big picture here at the macro level, how would you try to explain to folks like the top, your top several factors? What's gotten us to this point? And then we'll, we'll dive in on a lot of different individual issues. Well, hi, Mike. Uh, you know, it's great to do this. I love Fix Us, and, and I'm glad to, you know, to be part of it. I hope by going first, I don't ruin it for the, <laughs> for the future. Uh, you know, I, I guess the starting point is that a lot of things led us up to where we are now. Uh, this is not something that just happened with the last election, or, you know, it, it's been a, an accumulation of things where frankly we, we've kind of dropped the ball on a lot of a lot of things uh, where a lot of our institutions have really not done what they need to do to get buy-in from the public uh, and believe that this democracy of ours works for them um, we have people having trouble assessing it because our colleges and universities and, and high schools you know got away from teaching civics and teaching you know, critical thinking and the things that allow you to be an informed citizen, able to discern truth from not truth. Uh, we really messed up by uh, allowing our, you know, George Washington warned us against creating political parties and a lot of the founders were very concerned. And the, the, the original 
congresses and, and uh, elections. We didn't have the kind of party system we have now. And, and it's done a lot of damage because we can't seem to find a way to come together and, and people um, find this exacerbated by, by campaign finance rules. But, but none of this stuff is, is easy. You know, everybody has an easy fix, but take campaign finance. Uh, there are a lot of questions. There's uh, who should be able to give? How much should they be able to give? Uh, how transparent should it be? And all of, all of these things are, you know, they're complicated. There's not just one answer that, that takes care of everything. So uh, the corporate world, which, which has decided that uh, even though they're American companies, they get the benefits of incorporation, um, you know, are quite willing to take their jobs overseas uh, take their profits overseas, you know, get out of as much th as they can in terms of taxes. Uh, and you see, you know, whole parts of America hollowed out where people are losing their jobs. And so you lose hope and you lose opportunity for upward mobility. So it's, it's a lot of it, Mike. You know, I, we can go into individual pieces as you want, but uh, people came into the last few years saying something's not working we need to make a change. I don't know what it's going to be, but we need to make a change. And, and so we need to think, we can't just, one, one last thing here. We don't, we don't want to just go back to the norm. We want, I think it's got to be a new norm. We got to address those problems and fix them. You talked a lot. I mean, you just kind of alluded to this, but I've talked to you before and I'm hoping you can maybe elaborate on this a little bit. This, this is a, a lot of people have their discrete sort of causes they think that have gotten us to this point. But this is really systems-wide failure, right? Institution-wide failure across a range of areas. I mean, you mentioned this is political institutional sort of issues that have led to this, but also I'm interested if you can dive in a little bit more from your perspective on the economic side of this. I mean, I think that from my perspective, talking to a lot of folks, reading a lot on these issues, there are many that focus in on the political institutional issues. There seems to be a divide on how many people think economic factors really should be thought about as driving some of our polarization, our distrust, et cetera. To me, it seems like it's obvious it is, but I'm curious, elaborate on that one. Like, how do you assess the economic situation in the country and how that's contributed to this? Well, I, I think different from some of the people who are kind of revolutionaries at the moment and want to just bust, bust up our economic system. Uh, yeah, I, I believe in capitalism. I believe capitalism is the system that best provides you know, for more people than any other system would. But the people who have been prominent uh, in important positions and powerful positions uh, in our economic community uh, have been too willing to pursue this crazy idea. It's a crazy idea that your job in, in the corporate world is to make as much profit as you can, whatever that takes laying off people or moving jobs overseas uh, or replacing people with machines, whatever it is, you know, there are ways to operate the capitalist society, capitalist economy uh, with a moral compass, you know, with, with understanding you have obligations to your shareholders, you have obligations to the stakeholders, to the community that built the roads and educated the workers and so forth. So um, I, I don't think our problem, I mean, I, there are people who are advocating a really transformational uh, change in America. I don't think we need that. We need transactional change. We need, we need people who can actually make it work as it's supposed to work. And in the economic field, that means you need people at the top who understand that we are a shared community. It's not just how some people in the community can make all they can, no matter who gets left behind. Because otherwise our democracy can't survive. I'm gonna pivot completely here beyond the economics to something specifically you mentioned in your first setting up. And it's a prominent one, frankly, that when we talk to people who study these, it's like one of the first things that always comes up, money. Money and politics, yeah. like campaign finance, okay? I think it was the stat I saw that, um, I might get this wrong, like there's been like 600% or something growth in the amount of money in politics right. and campaigns since 1980 or something like that. Um, being a member of Congress too, you were on that side of it too, but then I observed this since then. Let's, let's dig in on the role of money here um, and how much of a factor it is really in like distorting the day-to-day policymaking environment, what a reason distrust and 
try to be optimistic here too. Like, what are your what are your views on the money side of things, and what should be done on money and politics? Well, I, you know, I think first of all, um, you, you have to assess what the problem really is. There are people who argue that all members of Congress are bought and paid for, right? You know that that if Mike Murphy, if I'm running for office and Mike Murphy gives me money, you have bought my vote. It doesn't work that way. It's a really bad misunderstanding of the problem. It's that if you give me money, because you're not stupid, I know you, Mike, you're a smart guy. If you give me money, it's because you already agree with me and you think I'm the best one to get your views in place. But when you can give me huge amounts of money, when you, you can you know bundle it up and, and pour millions in, into my campaigns, you know, what happens then is you better, you, you have more power to make sure that the person who thinks the way you do is going to get elected. You know, that's, that's where the problem is. It's the inequality of the influence people have. Some people have a lot of influence with their money, not in buying your vote, but in able to make, making sure you can get elected. Uh, and other people have virtually none. Uh, so when I ran, this was a long time ago, uh, there was a limit. You know, no, there could be no corporate money. There still should not be corporate money. There should be no labor union money, as there wasn't then. Uh, there was then a, a $1,000 limit per campaign cycle. Uh, it might now be $3,000, $4,000, but a limit. And uh, uh, there was limited transparency. So I, 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 I would make it really different. I, I would take no money in the campaign, have no campaign funding except from individual living human beings, not corporations, not unions, not associations, not PACs, just from individual human beings. Uh, and we're that's what they, constitutional amendment, right, Mickey? You'd have to do a constitutional amendment to do that? I am not sure about that. I mean, people have, have said that. I, I think we have a problem because the Supreme Court you know, has made some stupid decisions along this way. But I'm not convinced that Congress cannot uh, make rules that say, for the purposes of a political campaign, individuals, contributions can only be made from individual human beings, citizens. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I, I'm not an expert on the law. It may be that it would require a constitutional amendment, but I think you could do it without it. Uh, pivot here a little bit, but studying on more political reform related issues, uh, something you're definitely an expert on, written several essays and books on these issues. Uh, we're getting questions coming in, I'm going to weave them in, both in terms of the people that sent them in and online right now. Someone asked, what are elements of electoral reform that can promote less partisanship? I'll build on that too, because I think it's related. One of the ones that someone sent in had to do specifically with primaries also, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, I'll read their question. It seems what drives many members of Congress towards partisanship is fear of being challenged in a primary, uh, where the most driven partisans and ideologues tend to dominate. Right. Should we encourage more to register voting or voting in primaries in different ways or ranked choice voting, like all these, all these sorts of ideas you know a lot about. So let's talk about that. Where, where do you see the, the need for electoral type reform? What are the best ideas? Why is it necessary? Well, I think there are a lot of reforms that, that might make things better. Uh, I can see how ranked choice voting in some circumstances, if you do it the right way with runoffs between the top two or top three, whatever, uh, might be uh, an improvement. But you are not going to change it until you get rid of the party system. I mean, Washington said it, Madison said it, Al said, don't create a political party system. This is what you do. The parties exist for the primary purpose of winning the election, defeating the other guys. They do not exist for the purpose of finding common ground. They don't exist for the purpose of making compromise. They exist to defeat the other guys. Uh, we needed those at one point. We needed them because people like us had no way, average citizen, how do you find out who Mike Murphy is, what Mike Murphy believes? Yeah, I got a party to tell you and to help organize you. You don't need parties to organize you anymore. You know, we organize all kinds of organizations now to put pressure on members of Congress. Um, you can find out whatever you want. You know, everybody go on the internet, you can find out whatever you want. Parties are obsolete. And now whatever damage they do way outweighs, you know, the, the benefit from them. Uh, because uh, when, when you have a Congress that is set up to be 
my team against your team, and here's a center aisle, uh, and, uh, and, and you're on one side, we're on the other, we're enemies, uh, where you have party primaries, where it is the purists, who are the most extreme, most unwilling to compromise, that decide, it's not just decided who wins a primary, it decides who can be on the ballot in November. The parties control what your choices are, uh, let's say that you and I are running against each other and you, you're nominated by one party, I'm nominated by the other party, and there are lots of other people out there who want a third choice. They want Maya, <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, and, but they can't because if she hasn't won a primary, no matter how much the public at large might prefer her, she can't even be on the ballot. I mean, it, it's an obsolete system. It's a stupid system. And as long as we continue it, we are never going to get out of the problem that we're in because it, it outweighs all the other problems. I want to build on this one because when it comes to party power, yeah. I, I think um, someone sent in a question and I'll build on it. But, you know, um, someone sent a question. Over the last 25 years, power has coalesced, and this is in Congress, right, um, in chamber leadership, right? Uh, they said in the House, the number and cost of staff have de has decreased by almost half while, um, while both have increased significantly in leadership offices, right? And they have other examples of this, but, you yeah. know, they're saying we're no longer represented by our members, it's governance by the few in terms of party leadership, right? So that's one view, which would seem, I would imagine that you probably agree with that. But let me ask you also the, the other view that I've heard put forward, right, uh, which is that there's been many things over several decades that you could argue have kind of taken away some of the party leaders' power to sort of control control their ranks or like this is and one of the arguments is sort of a gatekeeping idea, idea in terms of uh, primaries and whether they, um, for the parties to be able to select, you know, it, and also control money, right? It can mitigate some of the extremes in our politics. So there is that argument too. So I guess let's dig in on this even more. From your members that came to Congress, from working in Congress, right? That question someone sent in about power dynamics changing over time. I'm curious, what do you think about that in the day to day of Congress? But then how would you counter some of these other views? <laughs> well, you know, I, because I live mostly in the academic world uh, now, um, I, I'm used to the argument that the problem is the parties aren't strong enough right. that you need to have your party leaders, the speaker, the majority leader, minority leader, able to control better how their members vote. So let's imagine I, I represented Oklahoma City in Congress. So imagine that I had been running there, Mike, and I went around to all the voters, knocking on their doors, having meetings like this, and then saying, I'll tell you what, you, you have checked me out. You've tried to decide whether you think I'm, I'm intelligent enough to do the job, whether you kind of like my views, you like what I believe on these various things. Uh, and so, if I, you, you, you've decided that I, I could be a good congressman for you. And I promise you that if you vote for me to go up there as your representative, I will vote however the Speaker of the House tells me to vote on anything. I mean, it's ludicrous, right? I mean, the whole idea of stronger parties is anti-democracy. It means you, you have your club leader telling you, here's what you have to do regardless of what the people back home who voted for you thought you were going to do or want you to do. So, I mean, I just, when people talk about parties aren't strong enough, I just, I brush it aside. It's, it's not a serious argument. Uh, the, uh, the problem, one of the problems that you, you correctly identified is setting up the system where the party leaders, you know, dictate to the you know, they already do that, by the way, they, they do that. They look at Mitch McConnell um, or, you know, Harry Reid, you know, before that, you know, in terms of what can come to the floor, what you can vote on, what, what you can move forward. Um, and, and there's an offshoot of this. So I'm getting a little off here, but there's an offshoot. With this partisan system, we now have a Supreme Court where you, you are choosing the people in this powerful position based on whether they belong to your team or the other team. Uh, and um, so I, I think we need to go back to a system in which individual members of Congress representing their constituents look at every issue as it comes up, weigh it on its merits. And, and when I was there, I had ruled three things that I paid attention to. One is, what did my constituents think? I wasn't, not, I wasn't a puppet. 
but I, but I cared a lot what their view was. Second, what does the Constitution allow and not allow? And third is, what does my own conscience tell me is the right thing to do? And I looked at those. And, the, I, and there's no place to inject party leadership, whether it's controlling what happens on the floor or you know who can be the candidate. There's no place to inject that into the system without destroying the whole concept of democracy. I'll pull in another question here to build more forward-looking solutions, ideas, right? Yeah. Um, Congressman Hubbard, in your opinion, how do you do away with the party system? What do you do? Do you just open it up to non-designation? That's what somebody said here. What, what do you do? Like, what does that actually look like what do you think on that view? Um, I, you, you belong to a lot of different organizations, Mike, and I'll bet most of the people who are watching this do, uh, and every other thing they do, whether it's a, in a corporation, in a church or synagogue or mosque, uh, in a Elks club or Rotary club or Kiwanis club or anything else they do, they get together and they make decisions. They get together and they make decisions. They don't ever divide into team A and team B. They don't divide into Republican and Democrat. The ability to get together as a group. So what, has that ever worked? Yeah, that's how we got a declaration of independence. That's how we got a constitution really earth-shaking ideas, you know, that uh, people were able to debate, argue, reason together, deliberate, uh, and bring their own minds to it and say, what's the right thing to do and move forward. So, um, uh, yeah, how do you do it? It tr turns out that election laws are determined in the states. Therefore, uh, Nebraska has a nonpartisan legislature. Um, a friend of mine who is uh, the Speaker of the House in, the, in Maine uh, actually got tired of this fighting uh, and said, we're not going to have a center aisle anymore. We're just all going to be members of the legislature. We're all going to sit here together. Um, so um, it's easy. You, you would have to do the change, like the changes that took place in California where they changed their voting system uh, and their election system. You do it by state law. You do it by referendum or initiative. And uh, a lot of states, you can just do that. You get it on the ballot and the voters go to the polls and they say, we're tired of this partisan stuff. There's over 40% over of Americans now register as independent or unenrolled or whatever their state calls it. You know, the people are ready to do that. And you could go state after state uh, with something like this and you could change the system. I absolutely believe that. Let's keep going forward looking here. So beyond that, those ideas. And maybe yeah. something we haven't talked about before. Getting a lot of questions in. People are yearning for specifics. Like, what do we do? What are the steps that we do? Okay, yeah. so you take a lot of the broader systemic challenges we just said. I mean, how how do you start to paint a picture of if you could have your your way? What are the what are the top few either institutional reforms and or policy changes you could see, or other broader civic changes? Yeah. Deal just a few that are coming to your mind. Well, I see the exercise of leadership. Uh, for example, in the college community, uh, college university community, and it could be in the NEA or the uh, ACT, the, the education uh, associations, where leadership steps up and says, we are going, they start pressuring Congress, you know, in terms of funding, that we are going to insist that STEM is great, that using colleges and universities for job preparation is great, but we're going to insist that to, to qualify for funding, you are going to have to teach civics and you're going to have to teach social studies. You're going to have to have, you know, civics, uh, critical thinking. You're going to have to do these things. But it's not all about creating jobs. It's, uh, it's about also being a citizen of a democracy. So that's one you can do. That's leadership from the top. People saying, this is what we have to do. In the corporate world, whether it's B Corps or whatever it is, you need people who are respected well-known in the economic community, the corporate community, to say, look, we're, we're going to take Milton Friedman's really dumb idea that your only job is to make as much profit for your shareholders as you can, and we're going to toss it out the window, and we're going to call you out when you make decisions, you know, that, that are harmful to your community, that are harmful to your workers. You know, Henry Ford had a lot of stuff wrong with him. You know, he had a lot, lot of personal stuff wrong. But he understood that to be successful, you needed to be paying your workers enough uh, that, uh, uh, well, are you, are you hearing me? I just got my speaker. 
for some Yeah, I'm having a little bit of, you're getting a little bit of feedback noise there. Maybe. Oh, feedback? Uh, maybe That's let me better. try to, uh, yeah, I'll down it a little bit. Maybe, is this, is this better? Yeah, I'm hearing you okay. Is this yeah. better? I yeah. Yeah. I, I reverberate. <laughs> so, uh, so part of it is that you, you need people to step up and say, this is not, this is not what we want and you've got to do it differently. And, and that's got to come from leadership, moral leadership, character leadership at the top. Let's, um, in the few minutes that we have here, probably one more. Let's go to the, let's go to the individual level of people, right? Everyday Americans, right? Yeah. Um, what, you just spoke a lot about at the leadership level, which I think is obviously really important. But if you're looking at what individual people can do in this environment, as someone sent in a question that has, to, I mean, frankly, the way that people deliberate, right? I mean, they said that you've said, right? And I've heard you say this, certitude's the enemy of deliberation, right? I have. Right? Right. Like, but at the individual level, right, what people can do to get more involved and change on these, some of these things, I'd love to we can kind of close on that sort of an aspirational ideas of what individuals can do in this moment. Well, uh, if we're going to use cliches, I'll use another cliche oh, yeah. that I've used yeah. a lot. You know, another cliche that I've used a lot is that uh, democracy is not a spectator sport. Uh, we, we are, our, our government system is a constitutional republic. It's not a democracy. But our election system, and how we choose the people who govern, that is a democracy. Uh, and that requires participation. I have absolutely no sympathy with anybody who complains and says, but I, no, I'm not ever gonna run for office. I have, not, I have no sympathy with somebody who complains but says, I'm not gonna go knock on doors. No, I haven't sent in a campaign contribution. Um, you know, I'm busy, I got things to do. Well, you know, maybe you got other things to do, but it is this political world that decides whether we're gonna send our young people off to war to die. It decides whether or not you're going to have a system of taxes that allow uh, a secretary to pay a higher rate of taxes than the guy who owns the company she works for. I mean, all of this is decided whether, which, whatever side you're on, you know, gun control, not gun control, anything, whatever your side you're on is decided by people who go participate in the process. Uh, and so anybody who isn't anybody listening i would just tell you right now you may not like it you could turn turn it off if you're not either contributing or running or, or knocking on doors or somehow writing letters to the editor somehow playing an active part in the democracy i don't want to hear from you because the rest of us are trying to save liberal democracy and we need your help you got to participate so i'm going to I'm going to really wrap it up and close now, but with one more question we got. Some, a lot okay. of people are following on this. Know you, Mickey. They've known you for a while. They know that you run the Rodell Fellows Program for many yeah. years. They know that you recently have been stepping aside from that. And they were just curious how, you, how you're spending your time ah. beyond, the, beyond the, uh, you know, being in your house all the time now. Well, right? we're, we're actually we're in the process in terms of instead of retiring to, and going to no jobs, I retired and went to two jobs because I, I still uh, we haven't yet uh, found the, the replacement. I think we're getting there, but we, we haven't replaced me yet at the Aspen Institute as a vice president and running this program. So I'm still at the Aspen Institute, do the same job I had. Now I'm a visiting professor at Princeton uh, and uh, my wife has me out digging holes so she can plant new boxwoods <laughs> in the garden because we're, we're um, of an age and sometimes other considerations that, uh, you know, we, we stay holed up. We don't walk outside without a mask. We're, 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 we're not that cavalier about what effect we might have on other people. Uh, work in the garden, read, I'm grading papers, and I'm working on a new book. And uh, um, my publisher, Yale University Press, you know, wants me to keep working on the book. So um, I'm staying busy, Mike. I bet you are. Well, Mickey, so I want to wrap up on time here, but um, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining. We'll do more of these. Um, encourage you to go to our website, check out more info, but we'll be sharing recordings of this uh, soon. So, Mickey, thank you. Good Thanks. rest of the day, and take care, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Bye.